Hey, good morning, everyone. I'll call the April 19th, 2022 meeting of the Maine State Harness Racing Commission to order. It's approximately 920 after some te technology difficulties. We're able to get started. Um, is there any person's particular who would take a roll call? Do I do it? Which is fine or yeah, you would. I'll, I'll take the roll call then starting first with our um, commissioners who are participating via team meetings. Uh, Commissioner Barnum. Present. Commissioner Marin. Present. Commissioner Dunn. Present. Commissioner Norris. Present. And I am present as well. All present. Next um, item is to review and approve minutes. Before we consider this, I'd like to ask Attorney General Sturdivant for some advice since only one of the commissioners who is, are now present and on the commission were was at will participate in those prior meetings. So how should we proceed? Um, my recommendation would be, uh, I guess, is to have the the one commissioner that was present at those meetings. Um, if he or she could be the person that verifies the accuracy of those minutes, that might be one approach to take. That sounds reasonable. Um, <laughs> Commissioner, Commissioner Norris, do you have any comments on the minutes? I've reviewed both and find that they're accurate. Okay. Um, and before I make a motion or ask for a motion to approve them, one of them appears that there are a couple of adjudicatory hearings. Were separate written decisions issued on those? I would presume. Yeah, I can yes. Be, okay, outside of the minutes. And yes. these are just the minutes for those meetings. Okay. I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the meetings of October 28th, 2021, and November 5th, 2021. So moved. Second. Been moved and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 It's Aye. unanimous. Item number three. Consideration of proposed amendments to CMR 01-017 Chapter 21, which are the rules of the commission proceedings. Um, I guess what I'd like to do is turn the floor over to Henry um, and have him explain what this uh, entails. All right, so I, I guess I'm, I would offer the comment that if some of you haven't had sufficient time to review this, we can always table this to the next meeting. Um, it is holding up um, some of the processes that involve um, whether we're going to hire a um, guiding officer or not, but it, I don't want to push this along if you, if you haven't had adequate time to review it. Um, so what's your pleasure there? The questions from the commission first. I agree with these. We've had these in the past, but I agree with Henry if the existing commissioners have not had the time to review them and, and digest uh, what, what's entailed, and maybe we should uh, postpone to the next meeting. That's up to the existing board members. Let's um, let's check with them. I, I'm uh, not sure. I will, but I was going to ask uh, who who made the proposals? Have they been reviewed by the attorney general's office? Yes. And who recommend? Is there a recommendation for these? Well, I, I mean, we it, the rulemaking process generally begins with a discussion in front of the commission about whether they want to move forward with rulemaking. They they did agree to move forward with rulemaking. Um, w there were two fundamental, um, I guess, reasons that we wanted to amend the rule. One was to strike the sentence that said the chair must be the hearing officer. Um, and, and just to be silent on that, because that limits your ability to, ha to hire a, a um, a presiding officer, or it also limits the ability of uh, um, someone from the office of the attorney general to act as the presiding officer. So, if you're silent on it, you, which is how most boards and commissions are, then you're not limited by that. The other thing was that most of the chapter was essentially repeating the provisions of. Um, Title V, Chapter 375, which is, um, and then subchapters, I think, 3, 4, and 5, which had to do with um, the Administrative Procedures Act as it relates to hearings. And um, the problem with repeating statute in rule is that the statutes change. And um, 
And then you've got to have somebody to track it. We already found a few area areas where there was conflict. They both have the force of law, so there's no particular advantage in law to having um, statute repeated in rule. Um, the only thing is a matter of convenience. Or none of these proposed changes would affect substantively um, any potential rights or ability I think, to. I think the only substantive change is on the presiding officer. Is on the presiding officer. So my take, I, I see it's the changes are all redundancy, redundancy to make consistent with statute. Um, I have no problem going forward, but I want to hear from everyone. Uh, but I don't see a need, you know, to, 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 to delay this. We've had the public hearing. It's closed. Uh, let's just implement it and move forward. We're not changing anybody's rights, anybody's ability to be heard on anything. Commissioner Varnum, do you have any thoughts? I've reviewed it. Um, the only other change that I had a question on or just wanted to um, make sure that I understood it clearly was the new section four where the chair of the commission may suspend a license um, immediately to immediately remedy the needs of the sport. That's the only significant other change that I see other than the chair and the presiding officer issue. And that was there before. It was simply that it, there's a section in the Administrative Procedures Act. Actually, it's not. It's in um, um, the harness racing. Yeah, it's in the harness racing, racing section, section yeah. that says that that um, the chair can immediately. Sure. But so, what, all we did was change the language to mimic the statute because it, okay. there was a there was a slight variation on the language in the rule versus the language in the statute and, and both the AAG, Ron Gay, who was reviewing it with uh, with me and, and I felt a little uncomfortable about the way it was worded in the rule because it seemed to go beyond what was allowed in statute. So okay. that 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 was the change there. Mm -hmm. I would note though on if you flip if you get the chart open and you look to section 22, we, we made two changes there. Yeah. In fact, that was we, we inserted the word business in front of the 10 days to clarify that if you have a three day weekend sure. or whatever. That's right. Horrible. I was and good then, at that. Yeah. And then we, I think we deleted the phrase and not intended by the commission um, because it was talking about errors and um, and it just sure. you don't want intentional errors. So. So those that's are the grammatical clarification. Yes, exactly. So those that's the substance of it. That's right. good. Commissioner Marin. Yeah, I, I followed the commission meetings. Um, each one has been going on for the last several months, and I'm, I'm very aware of what it is they're trying to do. And I reviewed the amendments. I'm comfortable with them. The only question I would have is of Henry, if whether or not the legislation that just passed the House and Senate and soon to be signed by the governor, does that have any bearing on this? No, not really. Um, it has bearing on on um, a, on a different piece of, of that we're working on. What has to do with them? Um, um, well, that's about consent agreements, and it, it, it okay. but it doesn't have any bearing on this. I don't believe. Okay. No. Thank you. I'm fine with it, Mr. Chair. Report from Commissioner Norris. You good? Commissioner. No issues. Okay. And once again, but I'll give myself a pass because I wasn't sure if we were going to proceed on it, but we should have had, I'll entertain a motion to approve the proposed amendments. So, and can I just clarify your okay. um, you have to You have to adopt four separate documents in order right. to adopt a rule amendment. I think okay. Um, and so that is, is there a script or can you help me with that? So there, there, and I'll just, I'll just list the four. So the four are the proposed amendments. The basis statement, which is just the mm -hmm. rationale for making, adopting the changes, the uh, summary of, of comments, and there were no comments, so it just says NA, and then the very last one is the um, statement of impact on small business. So those are the four documents. You want to have a motion to adopt all four. Um, in the, what was the first one? The, the actual, the actual, actual amendment. This one? Yeah. So this one, this one, this one. Yep, everything but the chart. Gotcha. Uh, Attorney General Sturdivant, can we can we vote on all four of them together, or do we have to go individually? Uh, if if it ends up being that it's an approval on all four, I think that's fine. If there was some um, 
discrepancy, we can revisit the vote. But um, I think uh, from what I'm hearing so far, I think for convenience, right. you can present them all together any, at the moment. Any objection from the commissioners to uh, voting on all these together? No. no. Okay. So then I'll entertain a motion to approve the proposed amendments, the basis statement, the summary of comments, comments and the impact, uh, statement of impact on small businesses. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. We've already had discussion. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 It's unanimous. Okay, item four. Establishment of the 2022 Sire Stakes Schedule of Races. I'll entertain a motion to approve the uh, proposed Sire Stakes Schedule that was included with all of the packets. So moved as submitted. Second. And moved by Commissioner Nar, second by Commissioner Dunn. Um, is this something public comment is on? No. Okay. No, not necessarily. I mean, but uh, I guess, yeah. Uh, unless there's any well, I desire to change people in the industry have seen it. And if there's any, anybody wants to comment, I think it's appropriate to allow it briefly. <clears throat> One good. Yeah. All right. Okay. Commissioners, any discussion on the proposed stake schedule? I reviewed it and I'm fine. <clears throat> All right, real quick, Ms. Perkins. I just think you might want to ask the chairman Chairman Council, if she wanted to say a few words. Oh, okay. I apologize. Is that would be the chairperson of the Sire Stakes? Yes, advisory. The advisory committee. All right. Um, is the chairperson of that advisory committee with us? Yes, I'm on. I'm online, sir. Okay. Could you just please state your name for the record and your yes. position? Yes, I'm Carolyn Corso, and I was elected as chairman of the Sire Stakes Advisory Committee. I believe in your packet. You received just a cover note paper um, as to the work we have done. Um, it was a challenge to say the least to plot six different classes of horses on four available race days, still give them the opportunity to race each track and yet produ produce a consistent schedule for both horses and trainers. But we thank you for appointing us we each brought our expertise to the committee, and this is the schedule that we came up with. Thank you very much. Do any commissioners have any questions? Okay, no. they're being done. Thank you, Ms. Perg. I appreciate that. Um, no further questions. We're ready for a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous approval of the 2022 Sire Stake schedule of races. Moving on to item five. Consideration of a proposal to provide supplements to finishes six through last. All the commissioners are aware of this issue. I'll just, for purposes of discussing it, I'll entertain a motion and a second. So moved. Second. Okay. Moved by Commissioner Nara, second by Commissioner Dunn. Um, do you want to? Yeah, I think I need. Comment? I think yeah. I need to interject. Um, we, I think the, what's clear from the legal review is that. The only way to disperse funds from the trust account is as a purse payment. There, we cannot disperse funds from the purse account and call it a supplement and not list it on, on the in the purse um, on the conditions sheet. So um, that seems to be the one clear um, conclusion from the legal review. But you are allowed, I believe, under Section uh, 75 of Chapter 7 to allow tracks to pay be, um, more than five places if you approve it as a commission. And so I think what probably the most logical way to approach this might be for you to just. Barry, have you got an idea? I mean, no, no. Yeah, yeah. So um, to. Oh. There's a hot mic, though. Can we please have just people from the audience mute? mute. She did it for them. <laughs> All right, so what you could approve, I believe, is um, you could allow the tracks to pay beyond five places for overnight events 
and you might want to condition that upon approval. I, I think at the end of the day, the horsemen and the track need to come together and agree on on something. And so the way to do that is to to um, point towards a statewide association of horsemen because that's in the statute. Um, that is a thing and that they should you could you could allow them to pay beyond fifth place contingent upon agreement between the track and a statewide association of horsemen. If if that is what you, you think is in the best interest of um, the industry. So, so to do that, we would kill this motion and create a new motion. Yes, because we because you can't provide supplements. Right. So so the, the chair had us bring this to the, this discussion point. So if we vote this down, we would then have another motion. So could you make sure we have a title and section when we make the motion, please? This is what we for the chair for the commission that we're not here in the past year. We did this last year to, to, you to assist 75 to assist the, uh, chapter seven <laughs> to assist the uh, horsemen mm -hmm. and to make mm -hmm. sure that they had a viable. Yeah, and, and, and they, so I just want to make sure that we have a written motion. Can I can I ask a question to particularly of the members that are in the, involved in the industry? Is there a timing of the essence here? I mean, I'm guessing that it's early in the season and maybe as the season progresses, this is not needed as badly, but it could be needed right now while the season's just getting underway or. It's most related to the fuel costs and as the fuel costs oh. are significant right now and to your point that first checks aren't completely flowing yet, um, that is the timing is critical right now. And right. It's always going to be needed. Right. And well, and to your point, what we did is we reviewed it. We, we as, as legislature would call it sunset. We would say today in a motion that the motion be re reviewed by July 5th, a date certain. Okay. So we would look at our three, our third Tuesday meeting date and say on this date we would review it and we could either extend it or stop it. Excellent. Makes yeah, perfect right. sense. Yes. That, that was my point. That was my question was the end date. Okay. Immediate. Thank and, you. Uh, and uh, when it's appropriate, this is Tom Sturdivant. Um, I would like to um, provide some observations. I mean, uh, there was a proposal that was shared uh, with the Attorney General's office. Um, the original proposal by the, uh, the proposal came from the, the tracks. Is that uh, Cumberland or first track? First tracks, and that that original proposal um, uh, had some issues that needed further investigation and, and the AG's office wasn't comfortable yet to sign off on that proposal from uh, a legally permissible approach. Um, I heard a alternative approach that was just presented just now that our office hasn't had a chance to review and I would caution um, the uh, commission that um, we ought to take a little at least time uh, to allow for some legal review of any proposal that deals with purses and paying um, supplements. Because uh, this proposal that was just mentioned um, is not one that we've had a chance to review as to legality. I hear you and I agree. Commissioner Norris. Uh, to your point, sir, uh, when we did this to when we did this originally, the, the attorney general's office did review this proposal and this is just a re affirmation of the proposal that we did to a year ago so the age the attorney general assigned to our, co our commission approved what henry and i are talking about oh is so that that i I'm believe sorry. we're just going to restate what we did a year or so ago uh with a time certain to review at, with an end date Am I incorrect? Well, the only thing was different. We they weren't paying out through six. They the tracks were supplementing, or right. the, the horsemen were supplementing the tracks to race during COVID. Right. So and but wasn't our, the first and second place purse reduced as well? Yes, all the purses were reduced across right. the board, and that's right. I believe that's what we're. It is different. This is different. Yeah, this is different. This is not. No, 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 they would have. You would have to do the same thing, and I, it's. Uh, um, you, you would have to do change the the percentages, but it would have to be agreed upon between the 
the horseman in the track. I, if there's a degree of discomfort about the legality of it, though, then about the legality of it. I think that based on the legal advice, we ought not to advise. 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 In perpetuity. That we ought not to make any motion today and to at the next meeting have a in writing a formal proposal that we can vote on as to how we're going to do it, what the statutory basis is, what groups need to approve it. I have an amendment to from. that proposed motion. My motion. Idea of how to proceed. Yeah. My motion would be that we. Um, task the executive director with gaining all that information and getting the legal review prior to the next meeting so that we can go forward. I'd like to have it in front of us. Yeah, that's all right. dotted and crossed. Just, just table it. Um, I think we ought to vote this one down, right? Oh, okay. And then we have a just, motion on the floor, right? Yeah, we have a motion and if we're all against it and then we just at the next meeting, we'll deal with it appropriately. Are you good with that attorney general start of it? I am and just to be clear to I don't you know I apologize um, don't mean to be a naysayer and I was not involved obviously a year ago when but it does sound like it was an alternate proposal and so it's just uh, being prudent and cautious and if it is not a oh yeah no, no, not, you're, you're fine we want to do right. it we want to do it right but for Perfect. the record it's not yeah. that we don't approve of the motion that's on the table it's not legally sufficient correct we correct. approve with the concept but we need to retool how we're going to implement it all right so then uh, someone from the pub public face. public comment next time when you hear of course. It. Okay. Yes. Um, so we don't we're we're not going to do anything with this today. Has a couple of questions that might pertain to it. Is this overnight horses only? Well, we'll have it. We don't know. We don't know. That's a problem. So we we good. don't have the details. That's why we're not moving forward. Could I uh, could I give you an idea how to come up with the money instead of taking it from the purses? Could you, could you do it to Henry rather than just? You know the commission right to, 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 the, to the executive director and he can try and implement it versus or go ahead i don't want to cut you off all right it's okay i mean it just we're throwing out all these ideas and it's well, i've been doing this for 45 years almost okay. 50. <clears throat> and uh, i've never heard of other than during COVID, paying for six seventh and eighth okay, so you're I, against I, I, think it's, I think it's ludicrous okay if it was 250 dollars for the guy in the eight hole that won I would be for it because that's a tough position to win out of. But just to give somebody money to show up and it's only 50 bucks. I don't think that's going to make a break in. Okay, in this well, it'll be on. It'll be on the next agenda and you can. Here's the idea it. I have. The, M the M Maine Harness Horse Association has a budget of $271,000 this year. I would assume that they're probably not going to use all their money. Why don't they take the 22,000? That's the number I've heard that would cost for the complete year. For, to pay out fifty dollars to the three horses, although Cumberland only has two seven horse fields. But anyway, let let MHHA take it out of their budget, pay the fifty dollars every Monday morning. Their secretary uh, writes checks and sends them to the horsemen for finishing back, for finishing out of the money. Thank you. And just for the minutes and for those, I don't. I apologize. I don't know. You could just state your Terry name. Mosier. Okay. Yeah, long time horse person. Um, I've. But I but probably I, but bet I, on you. But I, but I'll tell you, I, I really have a problem with cutting back the winner getting instead of getting 50% to 48 or 47 okay. or 49 and a half. This 22,000 that we're going to give away, it's going to come from somewhere. So I shouldn't come from the purse money. It should come from, I'm thinking just out loud, MHHA. If they want to do this for their members, they oversee their members, let them pay it. If, the, if there's any right, if there's a legal way to do it. Sure. Thank you. All right. I'll uh, call the vote on the existing motion. All in favor? Opposed? Aye. Okay. Unanimous in opposition. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mr. Mosher. Appreciate it. If, if, All I'm right. Sorry, I, I'm sorry. This is Tom Stewart. If I just clarify, unanimous, the vote down Oops. was unanimously in favor. I just want to get in the opposition was the, the vote was in favor of voting it down. Is that correct? Tonight's correct. Motion, so just, yeah. yeah, the proposal as current, which okay. doesn't have legal support or enough sufficient detail where the money's coming from, whether other winning horses are going to have a reduced purse, et cetera. We need a specific concrete proposal that is both legally supported and everyone is aware of where the money's going to come from and how it's going to work should we decide ultimately to do it. Thank you. Good. Yeah. Okay. Good. Item six.
discussion about rulemaking priorities. I don't think we need a motion or a second. Do we yeah, just hear from yeah. Henry? I think, and then you talk among yourselves. Does it? Okay. I do have um, chapter seven with respect to breaking up the qualifier, which was supposed to be in the last um, amendment to essentially we're getting rid of breaking up the qualifier. Um, it was supposed to be in the last amendment and it fell through the cracks and that's it's becoming more and more important to the tracks and the horsemen to get rid of this because of the horse supply issues. Um, and, and so, and for instance, a whole bunch of horses, I guess, qualified the first weekend and some of them didn't actually need to qualify, but if they break off a qualifier, then, then they have to requalify and it, it, it affects the horse supply. I'm not sure it really has an adverse effect on the wagering public because it all shows up on the, on the uh, program. It, it breaks whether in a qualifier or a, a overnight event or any, any race for that matter. So. That so chapter seven is I'm ready to queue it up. Um, and I guess one of the questions I had is, is there anything else in chapter seven that's important to you? I would like to see you give more. Uh, I guess I know this is obviously if you check with Gary Moser, you'll find this is a controversial subject, but I think at the end of the day, the horsemen should have more latitude to, to decide how purses are paid out. I just think that's, I'm not sure why. I, I just think we ought to think about whether that we should give, give the commission more latitude and the horsemen more latitude on how they're paid out. But go ahead. Right, questions from Commissioner Norris. I will not a comment. Uh, it would be helpful for me if you can just email us what you're talking about so we can look at you. And, and look at what you're talking about compared to what we have presently. Mm -hmm. And then we could make some uh, some decisions at the next meeting. Specific, specific rules that you want to change. That you're thinking about having changed. And that way we can look at your, your proposal, what's there. And we have to, then at our next meeting, able to, we'd be able to discuss them. And also have input from the associations. Right. Correct. If they know, hey, we're going to look at chapter seven. Yeah. Because it, it's not fair to these people. It's just like open ended. Anything in chapter 21 you don't like or, right, want, right. you know, we can't. Yeah, and we th that that all works. What we have to be careful about is um, taking comments when the comment period isn't open. And so. But there's ways to do that and um, we can get we can get there. So I guess at this point you're not aware of it. I have asked the association about chapter seven and I don't have anything. It's just that one thing um, which has to do with the breaking off the qualifier. I can't remember exactly which section that is. Do you? I know I'm trying to bring it. Can I ask a question as the public member and I'm probably the only person in this whole thing that doesn't know it, but what you're talking about is in a qualifying race, if a horse breaks stride, the current rule requires them to race again in a qualifying race. No, it's no. close. Okay. But it's, it's the next race after a qualifier. If they break, then they're going to go back. Recall. Then they go back and requalify, which is mo most of the time you, you know, unless you break how many times in a row, Diane? Two. 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 Um, you sure. don't. The reason that we have that rule is to protect the better. Sure. That and we've gotten away from that in the last twenty years, and it's and it's bit us in the ass. We need to protect what few betters we have left, and by keep man be pampering and letting horses race that shouldn't be racing until they go a nice flat line on either gate. It's deceiving to the public to the better. Yeah, you can go to you can go. You have a horse qualify, goes the perfect race. You go out, you make a break. I think we should get back to maybe with the trotters. The trotters should be allowed to put hobbles on and hobbles off. These, these things on their legs. No, I get that. Hobbles. Yeah. The rule it is a rule. Okay. You can, you can well, put them on and take them off without qualifying. Without I mean, qualifying. Disagreement with, but anyway. Yeah. Ms. Perkins. You're wrong. It's not wrong. It's uh, three. You can make three consecutive breaks. Somebody just said two. I didn't give any opinion. I just asked. Oh, okay. Probably the well, I think this demonstrates. That we need to have. Okay. Hold on. 
We need to have for an agenda item specific rules that are proposed to be changed and why and allow comment from all the interested parties, especially the horsemen and the horsemen That's association. The the com you said what, especially when the comment period is not open, how and when can we establish a comment period? By filing a notice of agency rulemaking proposal with the secretary of state's office. Mm -hmm. Um, so procedurally, there's, you know, yeah, we're going to need help from the attorney general's office to do this procedurally, open the comment do period. The, oh, do, you're right. Do the paperwork, bring it to the next meeting. Okay. You have to have the comment period. You, yeah. you can the, have the comment period after the next meeting if you want it. The, the general, my, my understanding of the procedurally, the, the issue with receiving comments is you can receive general comments about ideas about changing, you know, things that need to be changes changed. What you can't do is have a draft rule in front of you and take comment on it until you publish the agents notice of agency rulemaking proposal. So, so it's it's a, it's about draft language and that, that's easy to manage. You, we just have to pay attention. You question? Mike, no. um, only comment is after the at the next meeting you would, in my opinion, we would talk and come up with a draft. And then that draft would be right. open for. I just didn't want the chair to think that we could actually right. be Thank decisive you. and do action next meeting All if right. we had the paperwork in front of us. But right. can, can we, for the next meeting, have an agenda item for the to create a draft proposed amendment to Chapter Twenty One, then go through the formal rulemaking process yeah. subsequently? Yes, and you can look at draft language. Um, the public can, and then you say can. They can't until I publish the notice of the agency rulemaking proposal. But you can do it. So there's a so well, how what, do we know what the what the interest yeah, you can take you can take general comments okay. without them looking at draft language. Okay. It's, it's kind of nuanced for sure. Right. But well, I mean, I just think it makes sense to hear from the people who are going to yeah. be affected by the Absol changes. You can absolutely yeah. do that. But um, but once you have a draft rule in front of you, then um, you can't. You can't take comments on that draft rule, um, but so but I think we're all in the same place. I will come back with a, I, I can bring a draft rule to you as long as you don't share it with the public and, and invite comment on it. OK, and I'll do that for the next meeting. Thank you. All right. Any we're all set then on item well, six. I guess what I would ask is is from the commission's point of view, um, what else do you want to work on? We're going to work after seven. My plan is to work on chapter one, which is administration and 11. Um, and then we've got 11 and 17 that need to be worked on. But I can we can bring each one separately on an agenda to you with the ideas about what needs to be changed and and even draft language that you can look at. Um, but they can. Yeah. Um, but it's a lot to do too many at once. Um, I know we need to do so we need to do one and in one what I'm trying to do is get some more um, get authority to conduct inspections and to take samples in the at um, outside of a track because right now my the authority for the commission staff to be able to conduct inspections and and take samples is somewhat limited outside of a track. Um, so that's one where we're, we're going to entertain, at least bring it to you. You can always say yes or no. We don't want to proceed with that. Um, then we have to up. We have to do, we have to update Chapter 11 because um, the Chapter 11 is the prohibited substance chapter. And we're we've at a minimum we have to um, get up to date with the ARCI, the Association of Racing Commissioners International, um, keeps publishing new lists of prohibited substance. So we have to readopt that periodically um, by reference. In Chapter 17, which is the um, penalties, we, we need to fix the uh, we need to fix the sections that relate to um, serial violations, if you will, or or a history of violations as we we adopted something from the ARCI and it found it wasn't workable from our end. And so, Henry, would it be possible for you to map out? Those 
um, that plan of for, what you're each chapter for each chapter, what you think, and then so that you're not cross purposes from one chapter to the other, and that it's a methodical, deliberate action so that everyone knows, you know, what the intention is, and then we can anticipate the work that would need to go into it in any um, yeah, I, references that we would need to. I believe I can do that. I think that from a priority perspective, I think the chapter seven is one that I've been getting a lot of heat for not remembering to do that. And I know I know not everybody agrees on whether <laughs> how that language should read, but I'm I'm hearing from the Horsemen's Association and the tracks that this that this is antiquated and that it's limiting the number of horses. So I'll try to cue that one up and have a have it the exact language before you, and then I'll just have a, a memo, I, that, I guess, that describes um, potential changes conceptually by chapter. Um, and then I think, um, and that would be it, I guess, because some of this discussion in item six is going to spill over into item seven slightly too. Uh, but we can stop it there. I, I don't think you need a motion. Um, um, you, I can, it's just a discussion. Yep. I just need, you know, you just want to make uh, commissioners Varnum and Marin. Do you guys have any questions? I'm sorry, I don't want to forget you. No, um, I think that Diane's idea to have um, the exact plan of what is being proposed is <coughs> great. I have no idea what Henry, what has been discussed in the past, um, what the Horsemen's Association has said to Henry or the tracks, what their issues are. I would like to know exactly what their issues are um, because I have some issues that I have too. So I would like to have the chance to review chapter seven entirely. Mr. Merritt, so anything? Set. I'm all set. Thank you. I approve the process and uh, I'm very happy that we're going to move forward on these things. Very good. All right. Item seven industry strategic planning considerations. Okay. I just you know, this is just the opportunity to think about where where we're headed in the future and and how we might be able to ensure sustainability of harness racing. I'm, sure. <laughs> I'm just kicking it off, and the only reason I'm doing that is because I'm retiring, and I, um, at, you know, I will be retired from the state service at the end of this month, and I. I believe I will likely be available under contract until then. My replacement is both employed and to some degree trained and ready to go. Um, so I'm I've reached this point where I I kind of ready to pass the baton, but I want to queue up some thoughts for, for the commissioners to just think about to a certain degree. And so I'll just start with um, you know. I just want to share what I think are the most important things to make sure that harness racing continues as a as a going concern in the state of Maine. Number one is clearly getting a commercial track in southern Maine. Um, without that, I think the time is limited on how long we'll survive as an industry. I think we can because we, we will reach this point, I think, um, where we don't have the critical mass of horses and horsemen to, um, to hold a meeting. So I think that we, as as a you, you do, as commissioners, your primary job is public policy, and um, we need to give thought to what sorts of public policy um, decisions you might make that that uh, support the idea of getting a commercial track in Southern Maine. The second thing that has has come up to me and has become more and more apparent over the I've done this for seven years now and. I'm really beginning to get concerned about the viability of racing at, at um, the fairs. And in large part because the cost of holding a meet is continues to go up. It's it's almost prohibitively expensive right now. And the the countervailing societal trend, if you will, is that the handle which was used to pay that cost continues to go down. And the live handle survives to some degree, but at these small fairs, I mean, they're just not generating enough handle to pay that twelve thousand dollars a day that that it may cost to hold a meet. 
And so then what's going on? They used to get a fair amount of money from, or, or some amount of handle money from the off-track betting facilities, but that's moving to our phone. Um, you know, those, those numbers continue to dwindle from the off-track betting facilities. So, um, so that money coming back to the small fares continues to dwindle. So I think we're going to get to this place where the commission is either going to have to approve substantial daily support for the small fares, or they're just not going to be able to afford it. Um, and so that's just something that you guys need to think about. You know, what, what are you going to do? Um, so that's something we, we really need to think about. We've given $2,000 per year to the small fares the last two years. But if, again, if it's costing $12,000 to raise a day, and the handle that they are bringing back, maybe in some cases, is only three thousand dollars for the meat on the life handle. It just, I don't. It's hard to pay for that. Um, so that's something we need to think about. And then we've collectively, as an industry, we've essentially decided that it's not feasible, feasible or practical to package the entire meat and put it out there on on Roberts. Um, so that raises another question for the commercial tracks, I think, and that is that makes it even more difficult for a commercial track because we've, we've gotten to this place where we've said um, for uh, that the commercial tracks have been gracious enough to not race against the fares, but it limits the commercial tracks to trying to operate an outdoor um, entertainment business during the time of year where nobody goes outdoors. Um, November and December is a really tough time to to, to um, operate an outdoor spectator sport, and so it's it's going to be harder and harder for the commercial tracks to to stay away from that period when the when the fairs traditionally race, and and when Union moved forward, that actually made it harder because Union moved into July in what the third week of July now, um, so you know it took up half of another month. So so those are, are three the three things that I think we need to give some thought to going forward. Um, and I just I'm just queuing it up there again for you guys to give some thought to. I don't you you're free to share your views today, but um, I'm, again my purpose is I'm trying to share with you some things that I think are important um, and how we're going to deal with, with these things in the future is, is a question if the the cost of moving to that digital format that we had talked about at the last meeting was substantially higher than um, than I was originally led to believe. And um, so I just I'm not sure that's ever going to happen at this point. Um, I just don't know. I mean, I just I don't know where 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 we're going to head with the fares and the signal and and I guess they're going to have to stick with analog for now, but I don't know how long analog will last. So anyway, I'm I'm done. I just wanted to share a few things that I think the commissioners need to start thinking about um, in order to um, try to come up with ideas about sustainability of harness racing in the future. But look like Barry may have some. So I just like to have you put that in writing so we can have it as part of our history. What you've just given us, if you just give us that so we can look at it from time to time. If you're not here, you may lose that information. That's all. Perhaps a memo outlining yep. your ideas and consider. I mean, I was just joking when I said this should be a short conversation. It's a very detailed and vast field. Lots of issues. So if you could put something in writing, with Absolutely. areas that you see going forward for us to help the industry survive. I have a quick question on a lot of these considerations. Who who monitors our interests over across the way in the legislature? Like, for instance, sports betting, if it goes through, I presume that harness racing isn't going to see any of that money. I mean, who? Which committee? Well, no, which do we have? We don't have a lobbyist, but do we have? We have know, Don Marine. <laughs> the associations right. do. Okay, the Horsemen's Associations try yes. and rep. Yeah, well, I just see. I know the MH MHHA has 
has had okay. a, a lobbyist at times. Um, I'm, those are just idea things I see where we could be helped. Yeah, you know, no. where if they're going Absolutely. to prove sports betting, Absolutely. a percentage could come to support our industry. Is, 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 is I've got other ideas too, but yeah. Well, I will be happy to to write up with something, write up kind of for perpetuity, if you will. Um, <laughs> some thoughts about things that you're going to have to work through and consider, but okay. um, and I don't know if you if, if you're going to get well. OK, we can then switch to other business, but you're at public comment. You may actually hear sir. Commissioners Varnum and Marin, are you guys OK with uh, any further questions on the number seven? No, the the uh, the MHHA does have a lobbyist um, across this across the river, and uh, we are included in both um, editions of the sports wagering, <clears throat> neither one of which has passed up yet. But <clears throat> okay, moving on, item eight. Chairman, could just for one second. Sure. I'd like to speak to Henry. Henry, I want to thank you for recognizing the problems of the industry. And I've, I've known you for seven years now. You've had this job and you've tried your hardest to help it. And, I, and it's just been an uphill battle for you the whole way. But I, I really want to tell you, I really appreciate what you've tried to do. And by the fares not taking in that that signal, the proper signal to send out to our O2Bs and throughout the United States was a complete loss for the industry. That was a terrible loss. You worked hard on that. And for them not to accept that proposal was a disgrace. Thank you. All right. Item eight, other business. So I'm going to turn AA over to Miles. Um, okay. Um, but we just want to put this on every time because uh, both uh, prohibited substance update because the rumor mill works overtime on prohibited substances <laughs> and um, and and there are anyway. So uh, we'll just keep you updated about what what cases are pending if there are any and uh, try to do this every month so that you know um, what we know. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, well, well, we've had two weekends of racing. Uh, we've taken probably 100 samples or so of post-race. I'm not sure of how many TCO2 tests we've taken. Um, we haven't got the test results back yet, um, but I think we've gotten the screening and nothing has flagged up as to that. And we still have we have two, two TCO2 tests from last, pending from last year. From last May, I would point out. Yeah. Which, which to me is as is, is close to... Um, Blasphemy as as uh, the analysis hasn't been done and the results haven't been reported. Hearings. We haven't been well, able to adjudicate them, and there yep. have been a couple legal impediments to that. One of which you dealt with today, um, and and the other is the question of whether we could resolve them through consent agreements. And that is a um, commissioner Maria. Do you know the status of 1944 um, LD 1944? The last, that, the last that I looked, it had passed the House and the Senate in, a, in on an emergency preamble under the hammer in both chambers, and it was on its way to the governor's office. Uh, and I'm not sure whether she has signed on to that or not, but I will check into it. So anyway, consent agreements is a, is a way to speed things up and to, um, when the commission's um, comfortable with that. But there was one piece of law that's gave us pause about whether or not we actually had the, the authority to do consent agreements with respect to fines and fines are always part of a. Yeah, yeah. so uh, but if this LD passes, then we'll have the authority to enter into them. Yes, and um, and also again, we can now um, once I file um, the rulemaking documents with the secretary of state um, in five days that the amendments become effective. So we would be able to hire a hearing officer, which was what was holding us up um, at for those at the mo those two cases in the most recent. Um, now, pragmatically, how would that work? Like hiring a hearing, would hire like an outside attorney to preside yeah. and the board would be the fact finders and decision yeah. makers. Yeah, and you have to, in order to hire an outside attorney, you have to have a letter from the Office of the Attorney General um, to approving that 
and, and there's a lot of details that they need in order, but we already have that. And then we would have a separate attorney general say advocating for miles that we took the sample. It was properly handled chain of custody. Here's the result. And then the person accused could have their own attorney. They would be on the other side. Yep. Hearing officer would handle the procedural aspects. So say I wouldn't have to rule on objections, admissibility, et cetera. And then we would sort of act as a jury. Yeah, OK, I, I believe in Tom's listening in, but I think you can actually have potentially you could have two AGs in a proceeding one to and I'm not sure one is presiding officer and one is a prosecutor. One as the um, counsel to the commission, oh, of course, and yeah. one as the prosecutor, and then you'd hire the a separate presiding officer. That right? I mean, it's well, still up uh, in the air. That's not quite right, but it's um, <laughs> it, the but it's uh, but the the um, the idea of having a um, independent hearing officer assist an agency in to adjudicate hearings is common. Um, practice. It's done a lot over in the professional financial regulation division with all the licensing boards over there. And so we have a lot of experience in it. The 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 idea of the two AAGs is that the that the AAG that customarily represents the commission. And I know, for example, it had been Ron Gay and it's going to be someone else and whoever that is. The idea is that that person um, that customarily represents you like I am today would not be the AAG that prosecutes these types of cases in front of you because there was a law court decision that didn't like that process. But there would be another AAG that would prosecute the case. And the, um, but if you hired a, your customary, your common AAG, your usual month to month AAG would not be the hearing officer. That would be, you would, you would fire, you would hire an outside hearing officer that, and that other AAG that customarily represents you would just sit to the side during an adjudicatory proceeding and not be involved in it um, once it goes to adjudication. Um, but uh, back to, so yeah, the uh, so the presiding officer that you hire, the independent hearing officer would just as do exactly what you said, um, Chairman, you know, rule on objections and legally handle the case, but the decision-making would be done by you, the commission itself, the ultimate decision-making, the Hearing officer would just be the um, conduit to handling the legal aspects of the case. Hopefully that's helpful, but it's a it's a common practice that is done with. Um, so we have a lot of experience in it and it is efficient and will be effective for you if that's how you decide to operate on these things. At the risk of biting off more than I can chew and <laughs> embarrassing myself, um, could I serve as presiding officer? I mean, given my background, it's the one thing I know how to do. The current statute says you are. OK, yeah, so yes. <laughs> so is, yes, is the, the rule, sorry, the rule. Right, I mean, I would be more than comfortable in that role. I don't know if it would save money or time. Well, it, but, and, and uh, I think it's a possibility, um, depending on your comfort level with it. Um, again, we, we started this process long before we knew who the chair was going to be, so. Uh, right, well, so yes. it would. It would be good though to have the option. Yeah, you, you know, got I'm it. somehow conflicted. I might know the the person or something, or be unavailable. So I'm not saying you know I definitely demand to have the job every time, but if if necessary, I think I that's the one thing I could do right. <laughs> no, you're absolutely correct. It would, and I hadn't really followed all these, but hearing what you the discussion today. It's just adding an option to you. It doesn't, yeah, no, the hearing yeah, officer. Yeah. You, no, it makes perfect right. sense. I'm full agreement. Good. Okay, anything else, Miles? Just saying okay. shall serve. It may serve. serve, right. Yes. Yeah. Ron? Yes, an update on LD 1944. It was signed by the governor on April the 14th, so it is uh, a public law currently because it passes an emergency, so it's ready yes. to go. Excellent. Oh. OK, what is 1944? Allows us to have a hearing, a public a hearing <laughs> officer. Oh, no, consent <laughs> agreements. Consent. Or, so I'm sorry, consent agreements. All right, so then I just want to give an update on. Says 20. I had one more question on that one. Okay. So you said that there were two tests pending from the previous year from last year. Are there any up more data than that? No, OK. That's all we have. <clears throat> Um, so it says 2022 LASIKs payment update, but it's actually 2020. Um, and 
that was the pandemic year. I made a very poor, um, or I, I should say, I I had a quite a lapse in judgment in 2020 when I when we thought that that uh, COVID transmission may be largely related to touching surfaces. We uh, we decided not to handle cash um, for Lasix, and um, instead we decided we would bill people. Um, I won't I won't be around to make that poor decision for too much longer, but I wouldn't recommend it. Um, it, it didn't work out particularly well, but a whole series of, of uh, things happened that were rather negative on that, and it had to do with us handing the billing over to an, another agency primarily, and then the communication between that state agency and and the people are used to sending the checks to Carol, so they sent the checks to Carol. So it, it turned into quite a, a messy scene. Mm -hmm. And I, I will say that <clears throat> Carol's the only reason that we have any idea that exactly who knows what, but we had intended to not issue licenses to anyone who had pending um, balances from 2022. And, but when we got into the weeds, looking at every particular case, the business manager began to get quite uncomfortable with that. And instead, she felt the best choice was for us to send these letters out, which have all gone out. Um, and they basically say, here's how much we think you owe um, for LASIKs in 2022. You have 60 days to pay that or 60 days to provide evidence that you've already paid that. And, and if at the end of that 60 days, if if there is no um, resolution, then we would essentially bring a licensing action in front of the commission um, to uh, uh, suspend a license if we have to. But that's how, I, I believe, how many letters did you send, Carol? 15? Um, so we were down to 15 people who, but the, honestly, there's a fair number of disputes about whether the, that money has been paid or not. And that's why we got to the point where we weren't comfortable um, conditioning a issuance of a license on whether or not those have been paid. I see. Did you have your hand up, Don? But before, if you did, he did not. Okay, because I was, I had some questions, but then when the bells and alarms went off, Tom, are you listening? When you said that there could be hearings in front of us. So I would caution the commission since we may have to adjudicate to not ask questions lest anybody appear to be prejudging this issue. So thank you for the update. And if you need us to have hearings, we can. Well, and, and I I thought it was important that we bring this up because this is another one that the rumor mill has just working triple overtime. Um, and it's amazing the stuff that comes back to me about right. what the fate of these payments are. But in any case, <laughs> that's that's where we stand. Um, we've got 15 of them to figure out and we get them 60, 60 days. Um, so that's all I have on the other business and we Great. can move on to item nine. Okay. Item nine is public comment. If anyone has any comment, just please state your name and, and go ahead. I think we'll start with anybody here in person. <clears throat> Could this be anything that we've discussed today or in the future? Um, yes. Okay. I, my name is Dana Delisle, <clears throat> judge slash steward, and I wish to, I do wish like to recognize Commissioner Dunn, Commissioner Varnum, and Commissioner uh, Marine, and you, sir. I think you bring a depth of experience and competency, and I believe courage that I don't know as I've seen in my lifetime in, on the commission. And um, <clears throat> I just want to thank you for your time because we're in a very tenuous relationship in the horse business. Um, I watched Pompano's last race Sunday night, and I was there in 1980 when Niagara raced his last race. And they had 18,000 people, and they turned away thousands of people. And it was, you know, I saw it. It's heyday, thank God. But you guys have a job right now to do that's going to be tough to keep it going. But I would like to uh, comment on the race secretaries. Uh, the, the paying out of the fifth place, fourth, whatever, sixth, seventh place money. 
I believe it's incumbent on the tracks, mostly uh, and their, who do their employee, the race secretaries, to make it so these modest horses get money. I don't think we need to promulgate a rule or whatever. <clears throat> I've watched this for years. Wilbur Brown, Mark Harris, Adam Gray, Ryan Berry, all that very modest statement. I've seen, you know, horses, okay, for example, $50 a start, they're going to give them. 10 starts is $500. I've seen it for years. These cheaper horses fall by the wayside because they race for $3,000 purse. They don't get any money or they get a fifth. About Windsor or whatever, the army show up, say, I'll give you 4000 by that horse. Well, guess what? They all disappear. And that's the problem, and it's been going on for years and years. It's incumbent upon the race secretaries to get the fifth, sixth, seventh place finishers in together in a competitive event. So they have a chance to go for 1,700, uh, 3,000, 1,700 win this year, not $50. Yeah. And I think it's just kicking the can down the road. I've, I talked to Paul Rep <clears throat> last year. I said, Paul, can you write a, a track master of 58 or 56 for that matter? He said, yeah, I can do that. And he did. It wasn't a great race competitively. He texted me on the way in from Bangor. He said, yeah, you know what? He said, highest bet race of the day at Bangor that day. The cheapest horses were on the ground. So it was the most competitive. Exactly. On paper, it was. Yeah. And that's what better. They don't care about if they go in 150. To say nobody can win. 12. If you've got five or six competitive horse and races, that's what people want to bet yep. on. And they could combine track master classes. They never have. David Sawyer probably did the best job of you could, you know, you have you don't have enough like 62s and 64s, just say. I don't know why they don't combine them and handicap them, cheap ones inside, better ones outside. But <clears throat> I just I'll have to go to my notes and that and I'll shut up. <laughs> I just okay, don't want to miss anything. We're doing okay. Um, years ago, when I raced horses. <clears throat> oh, I guess I could absentee race secretaries. They're all absentee now, these race secretaries. With the exception of Kenny Sumner. And Kenny, unless he's got a horse racing, he's not there. He leaves that to the drawer at 11 o'clock in the morning. And you can watch the races, the film, and you don't get a real grasp of how bad the horse in the back race off the pan cam. And, you, you know, when I'm in the heyday, I remember when had 200, 200, better than 200 horses in the box. And we had 60 or 70 bought run horses, which I'm old enough to say I knew what a 500 claimer was, right, Diane? Yes. And Clayton Smith and Don Nafton, I remember Lawson, they had plenty of horses, but they would watch the race in every one of them. They knew the horses well. These, these race secretaries, today, they're all absentees. And I understand you can do it from that way because of economics, but they've got to be a little shot. They've got to combine these cheap horses. And I just, um, um, I'm almost done. But, oh, <laughs> and, and today, to me, it seems, I'm not sure if it's, well, I'm sure to a great degree, it's complacency with the race secretaries. But it's almost like it's contempt for those cheap horses. And it was back in the day because they had plenty of horses. You don't have any contempt for cheap horse anymore. They need the cheap horses. And like I said, this has been going on for Gary probably has been at least 10 years anyway. Because the Amish, a short of horses, a horse store shortage across the country, they're given way more than claiming price for a lot of horses. And until these people can make, I would say, $50 a stat, $300 a stat, these horses are going to keep disappearing. <clears throat> and that's the bottom line. And I think it's incumbent upon the race secretaries and the, their employees to do a better job. And now I'm done. Hey, thank you, Mr. Delaw. Thank you for your comments. Mr. Moja? Yeah, I, I, <laughs> Dan and I grew up together and <clears throat> we kind of think the same way in a lot of ways in the horse business. We've been through it when we, well, like you say, we watched Lewiston closed, we watched Pompano close now, and I was at Roosevelt when they closed, which was one of the greatest tracks in the world. But uh, <clears throat> for the for the for the for the race secretary, 
His job is not only to put the races together, to put a card together. These people, and I learned this from Larry Mallow, the race secretary at Roosevelt years ago. And he was, he was a gentleman that was from Maine. And he kind of took me under his wing when I moved there back in 82. They look at, he looked at the horsemen as his family. And he wanted to keep everybody fed. He didn't want anybody to be winning all the races and nobody winning anything and somebody getting out of business. And he took it upon himself to make sure that these bottom class horses, they race together. One of them has to win out of one out of eight, has got to win. I, I, I really believe that, that if, if a little more consideration was taken by our race secretaries in Maine, because we have three race secretaries, one on the grounds and two, I don't know where they are when they do the draw, but they're not at the track where he can associate with his people, look them in the eye, talk them to them on the telephone or texting them. I guess that's the new way, but it's really not the way to communicate. And they, they, these two racers that are gone, Paul Verrett and, and this fellow from Cumberland, really need to and get away from supplementing $50 a race to keep somebody from going out of business. Put these horses in together. Make sure everybody eats. That's the name of this game. Because we're start, what we're doing is starving ourselves out of business as we have no horses. I mean, thank you. Right. Anyone else here? Yes, sir. I will. Old, old guy, right. Your name, quick. Rangor. Yeah. Is there is a little bit of the problem with the race secretary? First off, I don't know who they answer to. If they answered it, because I've asked a lot of questions. Who, who do they have to answer to? When, when they put, like Gary says, they put all the cheap horses together, and then all of a sudden, one of them will say, oh, "Also eligible for floor claimer." Now you've thrown the track master right out the window. The whole idea behind track masters is to keep all the horses that are relatively equal. <laughs> In the same race, which would cause what they just said to happen. They throw claimers into it. Now you've got one that lays over the whole field or two, whatever. Sure. And that happens all the time. So that means we've got to figure out how to do away with that. Any sons have brought it up. He said, once you throw a claimer into a track master rating, track masters out the window. But they continuously do it. Maybe it's for horse population, whatever. And the only other thing I want to say about what Henry talked about horse, we've got horse population issues. So every meeting I go to, the first thing that they ask me is how are we going to increase horse population? And the other side of the table says, I'm not going to buy a horse until I know there's a new track coming. Well, nobody knows there's a new track coming. So this person's not going to buy a horse because they don't know if a new track's coming. The new track doesn't know if they're going to be built because there's not enough horses to support it. So it's a, it's a, it's a, I don't know what you call it. It's a 50 on one side, 50 on the other side. And all of us collectively have to work together to, to resolve this because if we don't, it's not going to last three or four years. You can have the best signal in the world going out. If it's a three horse race, non better, what good does that do you? We have to figure a way to bring horses in from somewhere, a cheap ones, good ones, whatever, to keep this going. We just can't keep going the way we're doing it. It's not, it's not working. All right, one more comment. Um, the race, too many race days, and too many dashes for what we have. And it's done nationwide. And I just, it's, it's, Yes. Anyone on the um, on the screen that has a public comment? Seeing none. Okay. Thank you for your comments. We'll close that. Um, I appreciate it. I don't want to be too formal. I want everybody to be heard, but I bit my tongue just to do we have any jurisdiction over the race secretaries? You have a rule that says what they have to consider, <laughs> essentially, okay. but they report to in the, general. We don't, but we possibly down the road could could try and implement some of these ideas. Chapter seven says who's in charge of the race secretary. OK, we'll, we'll look that. at that. Thank that rule. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I think it's in chapter seven. You hear your chapter three. three. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Report. All right, well, we'll just take a look and see if we can help with these issues. OK, Ms. Perkins. Mm -hmm. I just want you to know, I hate to use the word in the past, but in the past, the executive director has given a list of judges and officials, and the race commission has okayed them. Okay. And I don't think that has been done for several years. All right. Is yeah, that something we'll that I'd like to just speak on briefly? Last year, I made a decision to perhaps get out of the harness racing industry and get into the judging end of it. 
experience and all. I thought maybe I would do it while well, I took the test and I passed. I don't know how, but I did. Uh, but uh, and then when I went to the judges meeting here about a month and a half ago, I found out what they pay. The pay scale is living in the 70s. And I remember when Joe Ritchie uh, was running Scarborough, <clears throat> he had a he had trouble with a state steward or somebody. So he went to the legislative, I believe, and changed the rule of the law that the commission of the state didn't appoint the judges to represent the tracks. See, because they, these judges were all appointed by, I guess, executive director of the commission. They told them where they were going to judge, what trade, what fair, what, what what extended meat. And so Joe Ritchie went to Augusta, had it changed. And, uh, and ever since then, uh, what's been allowed is the tracks now and the fairs, they don't really, I know there's not a big pool of judges, but they, they just go with whoever's going to accept whatever they're going to pay. I don't know if the quality, yeah, I don't know if the quality's there or not, but I wanted to, I wanted to know if the, if there was anything in these rules that you guys are going to go over, are you going to look to take that back again? And, and perhaps the rate, the commission start appointing the judges and get a pay scale to, to, to the year 2022. And add that to the list to look at. Okay. All right. Scheduling future meetings. We've uh, we've got the whole year. Beautiful. Um, is it published on the website for the public? Uh, I think it, it. I don't know if it goes all the way because it's they use a tool. That's okay, but it, we'll get it out there. It, it's um, it only shows so many at once. Sure. Right? Third Tuesday of every month, though. Nine o'clock. Okay. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Thank you, everyone. Aye. Thank you. Oh, Don. Oh, you moved in favor to adjourn. Thank you. Take care, guys. Thank you. Attorney Sturdivant, nice to meet you. Thank you for your help. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye bye. So we can get Jamie to post this count. Yep. Yep. Oh, but we didn't take any, though. Who's up? Oh.